A quick piece of bonus feedback in response to the exam with lessons for what we can carry on to the next part of the season. So first, I'm really happy with how the exam turned out, with the exam answers, with the responses to the questions. It has been an absolute marathon to mark. I am not going to deny that. Partly because this was also really good, detailed, nuanced stuff that I had to sink my teeth into and really work to mark. So congratulations. An early season, early assessment item, and it was delivered very well. So let's talk in aggregate about what went well. Really good use of the theory. Uh, very pleased with the sheer volume and scale of research-led, reference-led answers. Uh, the applications of theories and frameworks were just there when I needed them. Uh, people who used the theory tended to use it well, or you showed me some high points. You showed me, yes, you can master this. So citation-led is what I'm looking for for the next remaining assessment tasks. Uh, it's also a really good sign that you are keen, enthused, and you're taking the knowledge that's out in the world and applying it. So thank you. Uh, the answers to the questions, there was a huge variance. Uh, so also what's made it really challenging, fun, and difficult to mark is that there is no way I could have written a content-based rubric for any of these questions. So each time it's been your interpretation, your take, the heterogeneity has been off the chart with one footnote. And I'm gonna come to that question because I'm gonna do a question breakdown in a moment. Also, the creative interpretations of the existing knowledge, the way people have used the theories, the, the different takes people had on the seduction model, the way, uh, People have pulled off interpretations that I hadn't seen before that with 90 students engaging in the four same questions, there was so much variance and variety. I'm, I'm really proud of you as a cohort for pulling that together. There was just such a great range of choice for me to work with here and just really pleasing to see it and I thank you for how most people took to the theories and went, I've got an idea how I can use that. Now, there are a couple of points where things could go better next time. One of the ones, uh, for some people, you found a source and that was it. It was your touchstone, it was your talisman, you were not going outside that source. You found it, you were gonna use it, and you'd use it to death. For rounds two and three, I'm gonna ask and invite you to go hard and go wide. People have pretty much demonstrated that they know where and when to use re referencing, even if it wasn't done 100% each time, every time, or done well in certain circumstances. The next question, someone would show me, hey, in one question they wouldn't reference, and the next question they would reference really well. So people have got that, but you know what to do, you know when to do it. Which is where upgrade consistency is gonna get a reference here. If you get an upgrade consistency, it's because one point in your paper was better than the rest, and I want that better than the rest to be your new benchmark. One challenge you have with me as a lecturer is that when I find out you can perform at your peak, I will push you to make that peak performance from the first assessment your baseline, your low, your low watermark for the next round. I want to see you at your best. I want you functionally at always putting in the best you can deliver. So when I find a peak, a marker point, and I see that someone has got the capacity to do really well and they do it in one point and they don't do it in the rest, you're gonna cop an upgrade consistency from me. Be as good as you can be consistently throughout. 
The other one that comes up uh, periodically is the edit under the influence. And edit under the influence doesn't mean academic misconduct, it means missed opportunity. I know this theory, I know it really well. I know it's uh, because I've been teaching it for a very long time. So sometimes when I'm reading a paper and I'm reading your response, I'm looking at this going, oh yeah, you're using this theory, you're using that theory, and I know the names that go with the theory, I know the citations, I know the references, and I get to the end of the paragraph, and there's absolutely nothing there. There's no support, there's no citation. But I can see that theory, and I know that you've been influenced by that theory. So you're copping under the influence because I don't think you've recognized that you were being influenced. I don't think you've recognized the theories in play there. And that's the difference between performing the absolute best in the subject and performing mid card to low card. You want to be one of the best that I have in my cohort. You need to know. You need to know your theory. You need to know when you're using your theory. I think of it like chess in that respect of in a game of chess, there are points where there are some preset moves. It's one thing to be able to use the move. It's the next level above to be able to tell me what the name of the move. The third tier, the tier of excellence that I want you working at is to know what of your choice of move sets, which ones are to be used here. When you use them, name them but also to have a few other choices up your sleeve for the counter and the counter. For when you make a move, your opponent counters and you counter their counter. So under the influence says, you've got theory in play here, you've got knowledge in play, but you haven't recognized perhaps that it's in use, so you haven't gone back and named it. To use the theory is one thing, to use the theory and name it and to know what it is, is the next level up, it's the more powerful. But overall, those were the, the main things, apart from uh, if you got completely distracted when you were trying to write your answer and ran off with a different question, that's pretty much the only place people went horribly wrong in this round. So really pleased people took to the questions, you engaged, you gave it uh, all, and I'm very happy about how it went. Now let's talk about those questions briefly, because there's some interesting stuff. All right, subaction model. This is the one where the asterisk applies. Customers, the other customers were probably the most commonly put to fourth spot. And I don't recall seeing someone put other customers up in first as your first priority to address, which is really interesting. And I think, I, I'm not sure how to describe why we're at this point, and I'd love to hear from you as to what you think, as to why you thought they weren't going to be the number one. Because the argument you can make for why other customers should be your first priority to select is that that is your market segmentation talking. That is to understand the needs of the market, who else, who will be in the service with my primary customer so that I have the right customer selection so that my customers are going to be attracted, the customers I want will be attracted to my service. So there is a rationale and argument for seduction to be up first with uh, the other customers. A lot of people argued that on new service, the customers would go last, other customers would go last because you had less control. And therefore, because you had less control, you're better off seeding that to the end and sticking with the sections that you chose to control. I think that's a good, like, I was happy with that as a rationale. But at the same time, I think that you could go flip that argument to put it up as number one of segmentation is critical, the right clientele through the co-creation into the space to co-create and co-produce will be vital for the word of mouth because you've got the innovation adoption theory that says the innovator needs to drive the message to the early adopter. It's a new product. You've got to get the message out. You've got to get adoptions. So the right customer and the right customer companions are vital to get the party started. 
At the same time, the arguments that were laid up for ServiceScape being first and ServiceScape being last, invisible process has got to run up at first and last, and so did service personnel. All of three of the four got to run in the number one slot, so all of the four got to run in the number four slot. The only place this went wrong for some people is you weren't willing to follow the instruction. Which is first, which is last. Some of you insistently couldn't break out and say, this is first, this is last. You had to give me either, but the others are equally important. And that wasn't, that wasn't the right answer. So you could go wrong with this question by refusing to prioritize. It's a hard decision and you decide, you chose not to engage. If you went all or equal, that wasn't what you were being asked to do. So watch yourself on your questions that you don't, uh, not just my assessments, watch yourself that you don't put yourself into a difficult situation by not engaging the requirements. Question two, there was some really interesting and high theory arguments here around uh, differentiating co-creation and, co and customer participation. Uh, the people who brought up that customer participation sits within co-creation now, that co-creation was a requirement for um, all value to be created, a la Barco and Louche, versus customer participation is only required where in certain aspects. A lot of different arguments here. There were ways to get this wrong, but most of the time that was by skipping one of the parts. What people tended to do badly here is that you'd focus up on either co-creation or co-production give me 90% of your answer on that, and then one sentence of, oh yeah, and the other bit exists. That tended to hurt people more than anything else. This is a balanced argument. You're splitting between two concepts. You've got to give both a run. Q3, boy, this was wonderful. Uh, the people who brought intangibility in about branding and messaging of you know, physical goods, reputational elements. Inconsistency with customization came up. Uh, perishability, perishability and physical goods, the number of people who were able to point to fashion, to uh, limited edition runs, to firms that destroyed old stock, to uh, finite numbers, finite production numbers and the value that created. Similarly, uh, so heterogeneity got to run, perishability got to run, intangibility got to run, inseparability, anyone who grabbed co-creation of value, like, hang on a minute, co-creation of value has customer participation and co-production as a sub, inseparable, wait a second, so yeah, in separability, there is an argument now that you could mount in here that all goods using Vargo and Lucia's co-creation of value, all goods are inseparable because it's value in use. You have to be consuming, using the product, making it inseparable. So there's an argument there. On the flip side, quite a lot of people were also able to say, nope, things don't apply. It all depended on the case study you ran with to say intangibility, physical goods are tangible, doesn't matter that it has other elements, intangibility is where there is no physical element. Uh, same for inseparability, where the goods didn't require co-production, people making good arguments to say, okay, it's not inseparable, you can stockpile it. It may have a feature of inseparability and consumption, but production is separable from consumption. Similarly for heterogeneity, there was a lot of stuff around mass production, around consistency. Uh, there was a good dual edge argument I saw uh, raised over a few answers where someone went, it's the consumer 
who makes it heterogeneous. It's the consumer's variance and variability that creates the heterogeneity, that creates the inconsistency. It's therefore not the responsibility of the goods who are mass produced to be able to deal with the inconsistency of the customer and vice versa, that the inconsistency of the customer through inseparability and co-creation creates the uh, inconsistency of and with physical goods. So again, this was a really, uh, those are the really fun one to engage with as a services marketer, as someone who's been in the, ser the service dominant logic arguments, who's doing stuff in co-creation. This was really fun. I really appreciate everyone giving it, giving it their all in this. And the final one, expectation discomfort, the expectancy disconfirmation theory and servicescape. So many people beautifully meshed the two together. It was so much fun to see how that framework of expectations, how you picked up the servicescape theory of, wait a second, servicescape sets expectations Quality can be indicated through physical environment, physical evidence. Therefore, the best use is to have your service scape prime the expectation of your customer. And there was a counter position where people were going, well, the customer is where the service, the ex uh, expectancy disconfirmation theory resides. So the initial service scape is gonna create it, but to improve customer satisfaction, we've got to look at the expectations that were set prior, well, the expectations prior to encountering the service scape. How does the service scape meet that expectation rather than how does the service scape set that expectation? Uh, the other aspect that went really well, so some people did separate uh, treat it as a two-part question and talked about how to use Servicescape for satisfaction, how to use expectancy disconfirmation. That was a fair answer as well. But for the most part, a huge proportion of the audience that went with the merged answer, which is what I was looking for, combination of expectancy disconfirmation and Servicescape to set up using the physical environment to engage the customer's expectations so that there was management through that process. All up, really pleased with uh, how all of the questions were engaged. Uh, this is one of the thing, times where it has taken a long time to mark this because I can only mark uh, a finite number of them in a row because there's such depth and detail that I need to engage with and it's such a good set of answers. So congratulations. Thank you. You've created something, created a bit of a nightmare for me, but I can live with that because you've done really well, really pleased with uh, the performances, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with the next two assessment tasks. So once again, thank you. This was a really good assessment task, done well, delivered well, and really people engage those questions and if I want to talk about co-creation and co-production, you picked up that option and those opportunities and you took them. So thank you.